Great. Uh, so thank you for thank you for your joining today, and thank you for having me to your uh, lecture series. Uh, like Alex said, I work at the New York Times, and I'm a graphics editor uh, there. And there are about 25 of us, and so some of the work that I will talk about today uh, is is not really my own, but a lot of it came out of the graphics department, who are the people that you see right here. Um, the people in this group, there's a bunch of different people, right? Like, So there are people who are formally trained journalists. There are people who are really excellent designers. There are people who you know, uh, really spend most of their time as developers. There are cartographers. There are lots of different people. Um, my background, like, it's a little bit unclear uh, what exactly I, I am doing here, but uh, I grew up in the Midwest, went to college in Minnesota. I spent a couple of years right after college uh, in D.C. at the Fed as a research assistant, like a very, you know, sort of entry level. After that, I went to grad school in statistics, so I entered the uh, PhD program at the University of Washington uh, in the statistics program, and then a couple of years after that, I... Uh, I dropped out and joined the joined the Times full time as a as a graphics editor. Joined the people in in that first slide. So that was about uh, six years ago now. So I, I've been in at the Times for for about six years. Um, there are a couple of little uh, uh, notes at the bottom of that slide. I know like on, on the web you're a little bit maybe distracted, but so the Amanda Cox at Tumblr dot com. That's some of the work that I've involved with. I can speak about most of that with some kind of authority. So if you want to browse that, if you're if you're bored in the middle of this, or uh, at NYT Graphics, so it's our group. It's not it's not mine, but it's our group uh, Twitter handle. And so there's there's other samples of work that we do there. If you're not super familiar familiar with the work. Um, it's been a while since I've given a uh or actually let's let me take one step backward uh I think really the important question in data visualization, so given the statistics background that I come from, like that's a lot of the work that I do, right? Like I can't, uh, I can't draw, I don't, you know, the reporting is, I'm not the best with the reporter in the world, whatever. So I think the uh, idea about data visualization or the really important thing to keep in your head is, you know, what what are you trying to do? And so in the news context, I think the thing that, that we have strength in in graphics, that, you know, you want to do the thing that you're best suited to do things that we are good at doing. You know, we're good at uh, revealing patterns, providing context, uh, comparing different scales, showing geography, kind of obvious things. But if you keep those in mind when you're, like, trying to think, you know, what is the thing that I'm trying to do, um, then I think it's it's more helpful than, like, you know, just here I have this bunch of numbers or here I have this, you know, this spreadsheet. Um, and so it's been a while since I've given kind of a... Uh, a, a static presentation, like usually we talk about interactive graphics, but I went back and I pulled uh, some slides that I really like uh, from our deputy editor, his name is Matt Erickson, and he, he gave this presentation probably about five years ago now, so the, the data is a little bit out of date, but uh, you know, so this is just uh, combat deaths in Iraq. Oh, I think it's monthly, right? Like, so you can see, you can you can tell the pattern, and that's only the first couple of years of war. So, you know, obviously in the last few years, the the patterns have changed significantly since then. But um, you know, over time, clearly the compared to what is, is is over time, right? But if you take this slide and you you know you add something to it, right? Like, so instead of just the Iraq War, we look at the Vietnam War. You know, fundamentally, our picture our picture changes very much about you know combat deaths per month, right? Like, you do that one more time in you know, World War Two, another completely different vision about what this data is or what it's trying to say. And it's not super complicated data, right? Like, it's just a bar chart, right? Like, everyone can make bar charts. But I think it's a good illustration of the idea of keeping this idea of um, compared to what in your head. Like, you know, this number means something compared to what. It's all this kind of idea of, like, context that you're going to provide in graphics. Um, and what is the story that you're trying to tell? Like, the story of the first bar chart of Iraq deaths by itself, like, clearly a very different story than it would be on its own. Um, Here's a more recent example. You know, the other one was five years old. This is something someone in our uh, 
you know, kind of multimedia group. So someone who wasn't in the first picture, his name is John Wong, did, uh, you know, a few months ago when uh, when Bin Laden uh, was killed. And it's one of my favorite examples of data visualization in that um, I think it works well on a couple of different levels, and I think that's often true about different data visualization. So the, the idea of this piece was that, uh, you know, people submitted a form, right? Like said, like, you know, what, how much did Bin Laden's, uh, death matter? And what is your emotional response? So, and so people could click on a square and write their comment. And so, you know, you can, you can Google any of the, any of the titles of these if you want to use them interactively. Um, the idea, but I think the thing that is interesting about it and why it to me works is it works on a couple of different levels, right? Like, you know, it works in that you can see the pattern, you can see the, what's going on in, the, in that top right corner where people said it's significant and positive. You know, I don't think that the diagonal is really real. I think that's just where people click or, you know, maybe that I don't see that correlation is really real. But the idea of um, it works on a macro level, right? But then if you roll over these squares in the real live version, it also works on a micro level, right? Like, and so it's just an interesting example of, I think, a kind of a classic idea of data visualization where, you know, successful ones often work on a couple of different levels at the same time, right? Like you can drill down to the detail, but the big pattern means something. Um, another example, uh, one that I think was sort of successful, uh, is the uh, an idea of um, here are a bunch of options that people talk about about uh, solving the, the deficit problem, right? And so, you know, I click this square, and you can see what that would do to, you know, 2015 and 2030. And again, it's not a super complicated example. You know, it's not a goofy form. It's not something, you know, spectacular. You know, it's a bar chart. But I think the bar chart is really important in this idea about getting, keeping a sense of scale in your head. Um, the idea that I think often, you know, billions and trillions don't really mean much. They mean like a lot, you know, that stands for a lot. So I mean, you know, 17 billion really, I think, in a lot of heads stands for like 17 a lot. Um, and so the idea that you can at least see these things and when you, when you click the choices, um, if you, you know, you interact with it, you see, see them and, and change. And you can keep a couple of different numbers in your head at the same time, right? Like so you can keep it, in there, you know, the two bar charts are for a short term and a, and a long term number. So, you know, the idea that you can store more things uh, in your head at once, I think, is is something that data visualization is often successful at, right? Um, you know, another example, uh, really, again, just, uh, line charts, something that works well online that wouldn't work well in print. So instead of just showing you the unemployment rate, like the same idea was kind of like the Iraq combat deaths, like the unemployment rate by itself. Uh, the context is a time series, right? Like here's what it was in 2007, here's what it was in 2009, right? Um, and so uh, instead of that, what if we break that up into 240 different groups, I think is the, is the number on this, in this line chart. And so if you, if you interact with the buttons at the top, right, like I can see the you know, white women ages 25 to 44 with a college degree. And all of a sudden, instead of like, you know, the unemployment rate being 10%, it's, it's 3% for, for people like me, right? Like this idea that we can show a bunch of different variation in something is uh, provide the context. And so I, when I talk about these, I often, you know, think of the, the lines in the back and the analogy I use is like uh, background singers, right? Like so this idea that like, you know, their job is to like kind of like stand in the back, not really call attention to themselves, but make this whole thing sound sound useful. And that's a, that's an example that uh or that's a trick I think that we use all the time, this idea of background singers. Um uh, one more example. I thought the first uh, three were all a little bit too blue. Like I pulled this example together, and I was like, the color palette is a little, uh, a little too consistent for those first three examples. So I, I pulled out uh, the uh, example of, of one of the most colorful things that we've done recently. Uh, not recently. This is a couple of years old at this point. But this is an example of, of survey data of how what happens. Uh, what do people do all day long? Um, you know, it's a Bureau of Labor Statistics and different uh, demographic groups answer it, right? Um, the idea, again, the same idea with the sort of jobless chart is that you can find, you know, people who are like you. Like, I think we often learn by associating things that are, uh, um, 
that we know about in some way, right? Like, so how can I connect this to my life or how can I make it meaningful to something that I know? Um, but the interesting thing I think about this example is that I think this is an example that worked better in print where we were able to like show a little bit more discipline. To me, the example, the thing that's most interesting possibly about this chart is that, um, you know, unemployed people on average spend something like less than a half hour a day looking for work, like, you know, which is not, you know, maybe shocking, but it's just not what I would have guessed. It's not what I would have expected. Um, and you can see that if you if you change the change the tab to see like unemployed and and you watch the, the watch the whole graph shift. Um, and we say that, right? You know, we've we've provided a sentence for each of them, and we've provided lots of different examples about, you know, here are some sort of fun facts or whatever that you're able to provide. But really, it uh, it kind of ends up turning into like kind of a little bit of, of a of a scavenger hunt, right? Like, and then, so there are interesting patterns in this if you play with it, and you can see like, you know, you see like breakfast is a fun one to watch if you just click on it. You can isolate it, and you can see it. And you, over it, age is often you know like interesting. You watch start to watch you know old people eat breakfast and watch a lot of TV, and that's like pretty much their day, right? But um, really, the idea about where does the news go in this thing, right? And to me, the news was the, the most interesting thing was like you know how unemployed people like you know what's really going on there. Um, and I think it was successful in print and maybe not so successful online. And the reason for that, I think, um, is like the annotation layer is really critical. Um, you know, we have this thing that we say here that, um, you know, nothing really important is ever headlined. Here's some data. Hope you find something interesting, right? Like, and, you know, that has evolved over time. For a while, I talked about, you know, this text at the top of a graphic. We call it a readout. Um, and so, you know, I thought for a while, you know, a clue that uh, you failed is when you say, like, you know, when the readout says, like, here's some data, colon. And one of my colleagues, his name is Sean Carter. He's, uh, um, you know, he's he's super talented, and he's, he's probably a nicer person than I am. So instead of, like, here's some data, colon, he transformed that into, like, here's some data, hope you find something interesting, right? Like, I think that's really kind of like for, you know, for a news uh, news purposes, right? Like, that's not really so super satisfactory, right? Like, it's, and we do that, right? You know, and it's, we, we use weasel words, but essentially this readout says, like, here's some data, you know, like, it's really there, like, here's how people, right? Like, um, the idea that figuring out how to annotate these things so they mean something is really important, and editing is really important as well. Like, the idea of the ratio of what you have to what you throw away um, has, I think, classically made, you know, static graphics possibly strong Longer than some, uh, you know, some interactive graphics where the idea is, you know, we have all this, you know, I'm not going to pretend to be so arrogant as to know, like, know what you want or what it is that you are looking for. So I'll just let you figure it out yourself, right? Like, I'll provide it to you in, uh, you know, in a helpful way. Um, and I'm not saying that that's bad at all, right? Like, I think there's very, like, <laughs> You know, it's a real legitimate purpose about what are you trying to do? I'm trying to let people look up something that they care about, right? Like I'm providing them easy access to something. But I think it's a different purpose. And I think as long as you're clear about that in your head, right, you're going to end up playing by different rules about, you know, what the rules that you are going to want to play by are going to be different depending on what you're trying to do. And I claim this idea of let me, like, let people look stuff up that they're interested about. Like, those rules are probably different in terms of editing and annotating, which is fine. Like, it's, you know, it's totally, like, you know, designing agate is totally noble, right? Like, and I, and I don't mean that in a pejorative way at all. I mean, I think there's definitely super useful things in, even in the print newspaper, in the weather pages, and then stock agate and whatever, right? Um, but I think you just want to be clear about what it is that you're trying to do when you're doing that. Um, so, you know, here's one a, a good example uh, by one of our most talented map guys uh, recently uh, with census data about, uh, you know, what are you trying to do, right? Like, people probably care about their neighborhoods. And so when I think about, like, the, like, when is uh, let people look stuff up, like, probably most valid, often it happens on a, on a micro-geography scale, right? Like, everyone has a neighborhood, everyone knows has some place that they care about. Um, and so this is an example of race. Uh, the patterns are, uh, you know, really pretty interesting to me. Like, so each dot is, you know, how many of our people of a, of a certain race. Um, the... Uh, the interesting thing, I think, I, you know, one about how stark it is, um, you know, how stark the differences are, like really like how segregated a lot of big cities are, right? But then you can zoom to your own zip code, right? Like it, it doesn't, 
it doesn't you can you know you know I I'm not gonna pretend that everyone cares the most about New York, right? Like if everyone probably lives somewhere and that's probably the place that's most interesting to them or the place where they can, you know, annotate most you know, most reasonably. The other thing that I think is interesting about this when you say like let me look let people look things up, um the idea that uh, you know, with that budget puzzle, there was a lot of success on um, kind of how I think on Twitter, like, you know, I solved the deficit, I'm going to do 30% spending cuts and 70% taxes. Um, let me show you uh, how, uh, let, me, let me tell my friends about that. And so this, you know, this Twitter prompt was like, my census map shows. And I think the really interesting thing is that most people, when they fill that out, just left, you know, my census map shows dot, dot, dot. Right, like, didn't really fill it in in any interesting way at all. Um, you know, in terms of like reader comments on maps, you can click them up here. There's, you know, 50 of them, and I would say that at least half of those are not super interesting views. Um, I think the idea of an open mic being deadly, right? Like the constraints being valuable. Like my census map shows is probably too open of a constraint. Like probably too uh, too much of uh, too much rope to hang yourself with, right? Um, I'm not sure why I flipped there. And so I think just when you're letting people look stuff up, the important takeaway is uh, how can I get, still guide people, either in the choices of what you're going to allow people to do, right? Like you don't want to just leave so uh, much, so many choices. Um, or how uh, the filter, you know, the limits, like, you know, constraints are still super valuable, like, even when, even when the idea is, I'm going to let people, let people look something up, even when the ratio of what you keep to what you throw away is relatively high, at least for, for news purposes. Um, but so I think, you know, really the lesson I have um, generally for journalism on data is, is that, you know, sketching is very, very, very important. And the analogy I always use is kind of like, I think a lot of these questions about data vision journalism, there's like really pretty clear analogies to words, right? Like pretty clear, uh, would this make sense if it were uh, a story, right? Like, and so, um, you know, I think the analogy for sketching is that, you know, the best journalism is not Mad Libs, where you have a sentence and you fill out a noun, right? Like, and then you have another sentence and you fill in a, a verb, right? And so it's just kind of like this plug and play idea. This like, where am, where am I, you know, like, you're going to have to talk to people first to figure out what your story is, right? Like, you're going to have to look at your data first to figure out what it shows you, right? Like, so you're going to have to ask some questions, right? As opposed to just saying, like, verb, fill it in, or, you know, bar four, fill in, you know, 12. Um, and I think I feel that way about like kind of you know generic templates, right? Like often um, you know things that are very easy to template, things like you know timelines. Like, but the most successful examples of those to me are ones that were only worked because of some kind of some kind of constraint that only worked because something you know something limited you, or I paid attention to something that was very unique in this particular data. Um, one of my best things, favorite examples of sketching is is this graphic, which I won't make us all watch together, uh, but it's something that uh, three of our guys did uh, about a year ago, I guess. Uh, and it's a graphic about uh, Mariano Rivera and why why he's so great. And, you know, I think I've shown this to, like, collectively the graphics department has shown this graphic about baseball to, like, all kinds of different audiences, you know, Italians and Norwegians and French people and people who don't care about baseball at all. And they all, like, you know, universally people find it delightful. So if you have three minutes, I'd encourage you to watch it if you haven't seen that already. But um, I think this idea about being able to communicate things that, like, people don't necessarily care about, right? Like, the idea that you can communicate things that... Um, you know, like Europeans don't care about baseball, but there's still something to learn in it is like super helpful. Um, and so where does this graphic start? Well, when you start, you have some data about Rivera and you know things about the world. So, you know, Rivera is going to hit in the corners, right? Like, and so it just starts with a really, I mean, this is a real plot. We didn't fake these. This is, a, you know, a real starting point of what could this graphic, this it ends up being a video. What could it look like? Well, you know, I know he's good at getting, hitting the corners. So what does that mean? That's the X location of his hit. So I could make a, you know, a very simple graph of that, right? Like, it's not so sexy, right? Like, so what if I, you know, think about, I add, you know, I do the same thing with the X dimension and I add a Y dimension too, right? Like, these are physical baseballs. They, they have, you know, locations in real life. So I could, I could do something like that. Um, 
or maybe the resolution is wrong on that. So I want to like, you know, try on a different bunch of different resolutions, but this is still like a little bit thick and weird. So, you know, I could smooth it a little bit possibly. Um, I could compare it to someone else. So, you know, here's Mariano Rivera, here's Brad Lidge, who is, you know, some, by some definitions, you know, the second best closer in the world. Um, the idea is that, you know, again, often the central question in graphics is compared to what, right? So now we've made those preliminary sketches. What if instead of 2D, what if we move into 3D a little bit, right? Like, and so here is, you know, Sean made the sketch in, in processing about here, here's what these pitches would look like over time, you know, and like really got pretty far on this idea of interface. Like, you know, let me let people browse to see like what, who, where are the pitches and I can filter them and I can display them and I can do, you know, all kinds of different things pretty far in the sketch. And I think you see things going up here in, in the readout where we're trying to solve this question about like, how do I know what to care about, right? Like, you know, here is what here is one link of, to a view that you might want to look at. Like, you know, one link to an interesting place. Here's another link to an interesting place. But I think if you watch that video, I think it's clear that moving away from this, like, let me filter see something, right? Like, is the idea that, um, you know, all of this is thrown away, right? Like, that ends up, um, you know, turns into sketching into, uh, you know, a sort of a, a narrated graphic where I tell you exactly what you're supposed to be looking at and you don't fiddle with the parameters at all. I take away a bunch of control. Um, I, you know, throw away a bunch of uh, your ability to play with the data. And instead, I just tell you something. I tell you, here's what you're supposed to be looking at, and I tell you, you know, here's what some guy from the Yes Network who used to catch Rivera, here's what he thinks he's, you're supposed to be looking at, you know, someone who's an expert, someone who can interpret this data, you know, with a lifetime of experience upon them. And I think it ends up being, like, way more successful than, like, here's some data, happy filtering, right? Like, um, you know, what, you know, best of luck in that endeavor. Um, and so I think it's a, a clear example. Um, here's another example where form is super important. Uh, this is a, a house map, right? Like the uh, elections in 2010. Um, house maps always a little bit tricky because you know you have this problem where like you know my district in New York is like you know one quarter of a pixel or something down here, and then you've got like Montana, and so you've got you know all, all kinds of classic issues of maps which we try to solve in lots of different ways, right? Like. Um, I can show you, instead of shading, I'll show you bubbles, or I'll let you filter by certain districts, or lots of different things. I can slide by years to compare. And you know, it's lovely. I think the map, it moves like butter. It, you know, it moves really well. But I think the thing that we like way more than this map is another view of the data, which is what we call like a big board, right? Like, and so instead of showing you a geography, uh, you know, it's a map, right? Like I should plot things that are on a map on a map. That makes sort of sense. But what if we throw away that geography? And instead show you, you know, geography of house districts, it's weird. They're all like gerrymandered and they change anyway and it's whatever. Um, right? What if instead of the map, what if I show you, what if I sort the seats by where are Democrats going to win, where are they, you know, expected to win, expected to win by just a little bit. You know, our best political reporters are the people doing these sorting. I just don't really know. And the thing that you see about that, right, like is if you, you know, scroll down this page forever, um, there's one little square down here that, you know, this red square shows up in this whole stream of blue of the seats that, you know, Democrats were supposed to win. Interesting, right? So that's a surprise, right? Like right away you can tell, like even if I didn't tell you what these titles were, like you can kind of, the idea is that the red square like doesn't really belong in this column somehow, right? Like the idea that something interesting pops out, right? And I think that's often really successful for uh, for data viz. Like if you construct it for the form so that whatever is interesting it has a chance at popping out, right? Like and you can see that here. Like you know, this is a a Congress member who served for nearly 40 years. Um, in Minnesota, people expected a wind without very much trouble, and you can see it. Like you can see uh, that's his district up there. You can see that it changed its stripe, so you can see that it changed. But you have no idea in the map view that's interesting, right? Like, and so the view that you're going to want to look at um, is ideally, you know, a view that ha where something interesting has a chance to pop out. And I think that that is this view where you uh, where you see like you know a different form, a form where you've thrown away geography. Um, 
what more examples? So this is stuff is going to fill in live on election night, right? Like, and so what are we going to do on the day after the election? And so often, like, you know, you move away from the, the the first order variable and move to something else. So like, instead of showing you results, I'll show you change, right? Like, and so what are, how are we going to show change? What could we show for change? And, and this is really example is about the importance of sketching again, like, um, you know, I can show you change on a map, right? Like, I either show you, like, some kind of, like, you know, change overall, or I could show you just the, you know, districts that switched. I can make those maps, obviously. I could fill those in live without too much trouble. Um, I can, you know, show them as squares instead of, you know, to get rid of some of this problem that they're all different sizes, right? Like, or I could just focus on the districts that switched, and I could do it compared to over time. So this is like, you know, districts that switched from 2008 to 10. This is all, this is all fake data. This is like the day before the election, uh, trying to figure out how we show change. And so this is Nate Silver, who is a uh, uh, rent the 538 blog that we've that we've rented for a couple of years, did some projections. And so this is all projected data. So this is all like pre-gaming election results, right? And so we could do, you know, we could show the arrows of how big, big districts switched, right? Maybe we could show those over time. We could think about, you know, I don't even really remember what this one is. Um, we could maybe just show the time for the districts that switched, right? We could show, you know, was strongly Democrat, flipped to Republican for a little bit, and then went back to Democrat this year or whatever, right? Um, we could do that in a different way, right? Like instead of doing bars, we could collapse that to some kind of idea, like, uh, uh, um, and you know, colors. Like so, throw away some of the information in the bars so it, so it makes more sense. Or we can zoom out to see all of the districts. So each row is a is a district. So the solid blue ones have been you know solidly Democrat. The solid red ones have been solidly Republican. You know, here's the group that switched this year in the context, right? Like I still think that one's not so bad, but it's not really working yet, right? I could go back to the arrows instead of trying to show you all the districts. I could summarize them in some way. You know, instead of showing trying to show you all the data, it's often useful to like boil it down to some summary measures. So I should could show you some, you know, the percentage of seats held by Republicans by state or the median race. Um, I could do the those kind of arrows on a map over time. This is sort of like poor man's animation, which I really believe in, and kind of like a PDF that's just a, a loop of a bunch of different graphics that you can just page through and, you know, it's, it animates fakely, uh, in a poor man's PDF version of that. Um, at some point you get, you know, n none of these sketches are really working. At some point you move back to a paper sketch. Um, at some point, you know, like I think it's really important if you ever want to like really get serious about data viz that the time between a paper sketch of like what do we think about the arrows on a map to an arrows in print, like I think it's super important that the time between this and this, assuming you have the data, is you know no more than a minute, right? Um, and so, kind of this this here's another. Uh, idea um you know like so we have this this arrow message right like we show them we could go do that back in time right like so fundamentally the question about compared to what um you know so here's the uh, 2008 to 10 forecasted versus the previous elections and that and that's not so that's not so bad um and then you know maybe we'll clean that up for for print right like and i'm still you know this one is about six, seven months old now, and I, I haven't figured out quite what I think about it yet. Like, usually I've figured out by seven months away what I think about it, but, um, you know, it's sort of interesting to me, and I think it, it works. It solves some of the problems about how district maps it introduces a whole new other ones, which is always, like, trade-offs, right? Like, um, when you do the kind of sort of conceptual things, you're always, like, trading some kind of trade-off for something else. Um, but, you know, my favorite, I think, by far, election map is not, you know, not even something that we've done. You know, this is a 2008 results map. Um, you can search for it. It moves really nicely. You can do lots of different things. You can filter to just show, you know, ranges of counties that fit into different categories. You got this little distribution going on over here. I always think, you know, distributions are more interesting than averages. So you can see kind of like there's a lot of really super interesting things, but not us. You know, someone else, uh, someone outside of us, you know, takes the snap and says like, you know, oh, that, you know, that swat's in the south. Like, what is going on there with that, you know, that crescent shape? That's kind of interesting. And, you know, a biologist says like, oh, that reminds me of um, you know something I know that like Tommy looks kind of like in the in the 1860 right like in the south that's lost um, someone you know takes those out takes those and puts them on together and says like oh you know they look kind of like kind of similar right like look sort of a little bit the same. Um, Someone else takes that and says, like, oh, but you know why that is, right? Like, that's because, you know, in the Cretaceous period, how many ever million years ago, um, you know, there there was water there, and so this water, when it, you know, faded back, little sea creatures died, and so they changed the quality of the soil. 
So that just changed it uh, so it could uh, farm cotton, like it changed the, the soil. Uh, so that changed the demographics. So that changes the voting patterns 200 years later. But this idea of why, right? Like there's an idea that there's a story in here and it plays off of itself. And that's not a story that, you know, is sort of a generic solution. It's not something that works for everything. Um, is uh, I think the really important takeaway for news, right? Like instead of here is some data, how can I find you a story in this? How can I find you something that like here's what you here's something to look at, and here's what I think people in the world, you know, who study things, I think is is going on. Um, so that's all of my prepared remarks.